Um, this is um, an interesting moment. We, we arrive here on the heels of the news that George Osborne met the Murdochs 17 times in the last year. I wonder if people could just think, who other than their lover or members of their family, who can you think of that you've actually met 17 times in the last year? I mean, it's a very interesting thought. Isn't it? Who does one meet, even one's dearest friend? Unfortunately, we often do not see 17 times in a year. My landlord. Oh, the landlord. I think the he's landlord. Well, I imagine you're a pretty troublesome <laughs> tenant, <laughs> aren't you? Uh, anyway, I'm delighted, as he's, in a sense, already broken cover, uh, to introduce to you uh, Dave Banks, who's one of the most seasoned survivors of the Fleet Street Trail, having edited the Daily Mirror and much else, and much else. It will all unfold as life goes on tonight. Um, Toby Young, himself a seasoned writer, I don't think actually currently um, tied Employed. up with anybody. <laughs> uh, well, tied up with three schools, but that's, that's not our subject tonight. Um, Jane Martinson, who is the women's editor of The Guardian, uh, and um, Martin Moore of the Media Standards Trust, which seems to be assuming a new guise in that um, hasn't Johan Harry taken his case to you to adjudicate? Uh, not, not, not exactly. exactly. <laughs> I can I can talk about that. No, no, no. We don't, don't. <laughs> but I mean, do later. Uh, <laughs> I mean, at least he didn't hack whatever else he did. He is just like us, a hack. But hacks now we can't really discuss because somehow they we've gone below estate agents. Um, <laughs> well, so I'm going to ask each of our panelists to um, address themselves to the most immediate question, which is Dave Banks, given that. Trinity Mirror has launched its own investigation into uh, allegations that uh, there were these practices. Well, first of all, when you were on deck, could you hack or was that too long ago? Long, long time ago, uh, John. Uh, uh, you've got to remember, I was editor from 92 to 95 and editorial director of Mirror Group newspapers for about three years thereafter. Uh, we were struggling with phones that looked like half bricks, you know. I mean, they were they were... Enormous things. It was enough to get a signal, let alone hack into anyone else's um, into anyone else's mobile. No, I didn't hack. No, I I wouldn't have condoned hacking, nor would I have asked uh, a journalist working for me to hack. I, it's illegal. It's utterly immoral. There are. I'm, I'm, I'm saying far too much actually, because well, I'm, giving my, I'm giving my game away. Well, no, I, I mean I like to know what slate people are going to be coming from. Mm. Toby, uh, I'm not going to ask you whether you hacked because I'm sure you never did. But what I would ask you is. In your lofty position, looking in, as it were, from outside, but very knowledgeable of the inside, um, do you think this story has been overblown? I think um, it's been fueled in part not just by uh, public outrage over Millie Dowler's phone being hacked, um, but partly because of the political animus towards Rupert Murdoch. Um, and one of the reasons I think it's taken a long time for uh, the Daily Mirror and the Sunday Mirror to be dragged into this story is because um, they're less attractive political targets than Murdoch's papers. And it, I think it's, it's, it's not coincidental that um, uh, the last government um, were uh, so negligent about um, uh, pursuing, making sure the Met pursued this case S and, and didn't initiate any public inquiries uh, into any aspect of this case. So you do uh, see a it, sort it, of semi well, I think, I think conspiracy. Uh, I don't think it's a conspiracy, but I do think that um, it's not a coincidence that the reason the Labour Party in particular has, has decided to get so up on its high horse about this is because Murdoch decided to withdraw his support from Labour in 2009, and supposedly, according to Andrew Neil, who tweeted this, as I'm sure you know, um, when uh, Murdoch conveyed that decision to Gordon Brown on the eve of his 2009 Labour Party conference speech. Gordon Brown said, I will destroy you. That's a good moment to move on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps he did. I mean, he is destroyed in that sense. Um, well, uh, I don't think it was overplayed. No. You don't. <laughs> no. um, what I was going to ask you really was um, you see, I don't find the police taking 25 quid for a phone number remotely shocking. Um, I can't imagine any police system anywhere in the world, including the erstwhile Soviet Union, where police didn't get kickbacks for a bit of info. Um, and that surely is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a major 
revolving door situation in which large sums of money moved into the police and out again mm. back into News International, right? And jobs. I mean, yeah. it, you know, you talk about George Osborne meeting News International, um, the number of times Paul Stevenson met News International, um, the links that were being made with Neil Wallace, for example. I mean, that really was the sort of final straw, a man who had been arrested, a man who was um, giving advice to Andy Corson, who was advising the uh, Prime Minister, uh, who was subsequently, you know, had a job advising the police commissioner who came into the Guardian and said to the editor of the Guardian, stop doing this. There is nothing in this. Mm. Twice. Now, uh, you know, <laughs> first him and then obviously um, John Yates. Now, that's not just about £25, although I don't agree actually, John, I think £25 is not, I mean, police officers shouldn't take money, should they, for information. Um, but anyway, well, no, it should. That, it's quite different but it's from... a, a much smaller quantum than then doing these things where it, it st I mean, it's been said about many things in this, this whole um, saga, but it stinks, doesn't it? You know, you're being advised by somebody who's subsequently arrested. You go in and say to, you, you basically never ever do a proper police inquiry during all that time. That really does stink. And mm. the revolving doors of jobs between, you know, Andy Heyman, who becomes a Times mm. columnist. I'm sure he's a brilliant writer, but it just, doesn't look good. Well, well I, I, I'm always in, more intrigued by John Stevens, who mm. has been left relatively unscathed. I mentioned him the other night on the Andrew Neil show, and the next morning there was a, a tape recording on my um, conventional phone on my desk from him saying, you'll be hearing. You will be hearing. Did you hear? And <laughs> early in the week, well, that was two weeks ago, and unfortunately I've heard nothing. <laughs> and that is despite sending repeated emails to his secretary saying, I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear really quite a lot. Um, because it was in a very short space of time that he moved from being the chief of the Metropolitan Police uh, to um, being a major, one of the best paid columnists in the whole of the news of the world. Mm. A remarkable um, turnaround. Um, clearly it was a wonderful journalist waiting to get out. Um, uh, Ma Martin, um, I mean, the Media Standards Trust may not be known to everybody. Its greatest uh, claim to fame, I imagine, is that it's not the PCC. Um, <laughs> well, uh, well, I suppose, I suppose, actually, probably better, the better description of me on this panel is one of the founders of the Hacked Off campaign rather than mm. Uh, the Media Standards Trust, uh, although... It's although just that the email said synonymous. Media Standards Trust, you know how these things are. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, but but uh, do speak on both. Okay, um, well... Hacked, hacked off, off first. The hacked off was... was um, so there are a few of us have been, have been sort of fussing about this for a few years now um, and not getting very far. When I say fussing, I think we first called for some sort of inquiry two years ago um, after the Gordon Taylor uh, uh, Guardian investigation. Um, and We've consistently done so since, and we got increasingly frustrated, and it wasn't really going anywhere. So a couple of months ago, Brian Cathcart and I uh, said, we have to cohere some of the disparate people and organizations who want to have a public inquiry, who want to get to the bottom of this, and, and pull it into a campaign. Um, we, we did that. Uh, we had a formal launch all set and prepared for the, <laughs> the 6th of July. Um, we had no idea about the Dallas story, um, which broke on uh, 5 p.m. on the 4th of July. Um, and so we, we brought forward the start of it. And then, and then that was partly a petition, which was signed by thousands and thousands of people. It was partly us um, campaigning and pressing the uh, party leaders for both an inquiry and an inquiry in the right terms and the right mm. timing. An inquiry into what? Well, this, we, we, we specifically laid out in, in the original manifesto um, the areas that we thought needed to be looked into. And they included not only the in illegal information gathering, but the relationship between the press and the police and the mm. relationship between the press and the politicians. And that was actually the, the second one partly, but the third one particularly was where we had an awful lot of trouble and why we went to meet all the party leaders. We met Clegg and then Miliband and then Cameron and walked them through <coughs> all our sort of, what we thought would be a, a successful and a good inquiry um, uh, uh, to say you can't, you can't do this on narrow terms. You have to do this on broad terms because otherwise people are going to look at it and say this is a stitch up. Well, um, Toby, you um, hinted that it was much wider than just uh, News International, but it has obviously suited News International's competitors um, clearly to focus on News International. And in part, surely the focus on News International is in part because it's not a British operation. And I'm wondering if you can think of, I've been trawling through trying to find any other country 
that actually allows um, a third plus of its media to be controlled by people who have no accountability uh, in the country in which they're operating. Certainly not possible in America or Australia, Canada, you know, most of the other comparable societies. Yeah, well, and that's why Murdoch became an American citizen. Indeed. Um, I, I think that, 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 that partly accounts for why the focus has been on News International, but I don't think it's, it's the, big, the big reason. I think um, my feeling is that Murdoch had for a long time been um, a bogeyman on the left. Um, and uh, he was targeted during Mrs. Thatcher's reign uh, frequently. Um, effigies were made of him, and so on and so forth. Uh, but then when he threw his weight behind Tony Blair, um, <coughs> uh, and subsequently Gordon Brown, um, members of the liberal left had to bite their tongue. And I think were made extremely uncomfortable by effectively being in bed with someone who they thought epitomized everything that was wrong. You know, it was the unacceptable face of capitalism. Um, so I think, in a way, their rage that they've been venting about Murdoch um, over the past few weeks has partly been fueled by a kind of self-disgust uh, that uh, they allowed themselves to um, uh, be muzzled by their own sense of what was in their political interests. Uh, Dave, I think it's true that, that um, all of us knew that there was, was this sort of dark cancer uh, in our midst. I'm not saying that's what he was, but that there was something which we couldn't quite get our hands on and didn't particularly want to get our hands on. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering whether in fact it's partly our fault that we are in the mess we're in. I'm very fortunate. Whenever I'm introduced, I'm introduced as the former editor of the Daily Mirror. And there are a lot of us, by the way. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of former editors. A big club. Wouldn't fit in this room. But uh, I, I spent most of my career, more of my career, working for Rupert Murdoch. And that tends to be, fortunately at the moment, overlooked. Um, I worked on three continents for him. I worked on the New York Post. I worked on the Sun. I edited two papers in Australia for him, the Australian and the Telegraph in Sydney. Uh, so I've, I've kind of seen both sides in a way. And I worked vociferously against him when I was editor of the Mirror. I, I just think it's a very, it's very emotive to talk about a dark cancer. Um, the, the trouble is I can divorce Rupert Murdoch from News Corp and, and his power base. I actually rather like the man and I, like a lot of journalists who worked at a, probably at a senior level for him, I, I rather admire him. Uh, but I dislike very much the hold he has on the business. If that's the cancer of which you speak, then I would accord with that. I think well, it's it is a schizophrenic a dangerous thing, isn't it? Because on the one hand, he's brought people access mm. to a world that they had no access to before. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of channels of sport and mm -hmm. God knows what. So the upside is very great. And my God, what would happen if the 10 million people with dishes found that in some way he'd been denied a license to go on broadcasting. It's hard to imagine that there would be peace on the streets. No. We probably, ha we probably also would have no times, maybe no Sunday times, maybe even no sun. When he took over the sun, it was a foundling infant. IPC sold it to them, and uh, or to him, and laughed the way to the bank because Ooh. they thought they'd loaded this silly sucker of, a, of an Australian with a dying infant. And in mm. fact, he put to page three uh, together, he put Larry Lamb in charge, he, he begat Kelvin, he begat a whole generation of journalism of which we might not approve, but in doing so, and then, and then out of that came Sky, and Sky has pushed the bounds of probably say premiership Ooh. football as well, it's pushed the bounds of television, so it will be who's a mirror man to, to be yeah. uh, uh, punting for Rupert Murdoch, mm. but then, then we need to be fair about this. Yeah, mm. I think dark cancer is far too strong. I mean, a mixed bag, perhaps, but uh, to well, add to I the feel, list well, of well, papers... Perhaps you could challenge it by suggesting to me anybody else who's <coughs> had the purchase of possibly British aerospace systems, I don't know, but who else has had the purchase on the political classes that he's had with our connivance? Well, you say with your connivance, I think that there's the well, rub. When did you, I mean, yeah, when did you report uh, the, the, the number of, mi the minutage, or the, indeed the number of occasions that direct access was had? 
I think, I think well, I, I've, I've certainly blotted my copybook with the Murdoch clan. I reported a story about um, uh, what happened on Elizabeth Murdoch's hen night when um, uh, <laughs> she was in the back of a limo with various celebrities uh, and, in, and, and Rebecca Wade, as she then was, and um, yes, yes. Uh, they were all a bit worse <laughs> for wear, and they spotted a, 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 a pap on a motorbike following them. And um, Liz got a little bit nervous. I call her Liz not because I've ever met her. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, she conveyed this nervousness to Rebecca, who said, don't worry, let me take care of this and uh, called up the News of the World picture desk, rattled off a description of this motorcyclist, and within a minute, um, someone had called her back with his name and telephone number. She then called him and told him that the limousine he was following contained not only the editor of the News of the World, as she then was, but the daughter of Rupert Murdoch, and if he didn't immediately execute a U-turn, he'd never work in this town again, and <laughs> off he disappeared over the horizon. <laughs> and they, they've never forgiven me for reporting that. Um, but I think... Uh, uh, just to add to the list of papers that might not exist, at least not in their present form, mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for Rupert Murdoch, I don't think the Independent or the Independent on Sunday would likely exist. I think by challenging the power of the print unions, he made it, uh, he made it uh, much more uh, possible to produce newspapers. Um, and I'm not sure The Guardian and The Observer would still exist either. I mean, The Guardian, at present, loses something like 35 million a year, would be losing much yeah, more than that. I mean, the power of the print unions the, hadn't extended by maybe 10 years. Uh, the, the working life of, of print journalists in this country. Yeah. I must just interject, I do think we're quite quickly getting into this sort of great extremes in uh, any journalist discussion where, you know, Rupert Murdoch as bogeyman, I don't think has actually been the case really for some years. You know, I was media editor until six months ago of The Guardian and actually I think for several years <coughs> there was a sense that oh my god, he's not a KGB officer, oh my god, he's not Richard Desmond, the man has put lots of money into journalists and journalism in this country. So I think there was a rewriting. I wouldn't go quite so far as you're now doing, which is basically then we say, the man's a saviour. I mean, he saved the press in this country. I also think, I, I sort of disagree, this is I not just press, about... I, I agree that he's extended really its really is not about a liberal conspiracy against one powerful man. I mean, and I'm sure you see uh, The Guardian and Channel 4 as part of this great liberal left media conspiracy. Probably the BBC are in there as well. Uh, you know, this is a story where it, the sense that sort of Nick Davis was out there, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to bring down the most powerful man. Of course, it has purchase as a story because it involves an enormously uh, powerful organisation and the biggest selling newspaper in this country. This, you know, to suggest somehow that's the only reason it's this conspiracy that that Gordon Brown was going to break Tony. It, it, it's sort of it, it's madness. I mean, you forget that Gordon Brown did told everybody about what happened with his son a week after Millie Dowler had given politicians the ability to say, "Oh God, I was scared of him." Yes, yes, I should have done something about it earlier. You know, this is, if it's a conspiracy, it's a conspiracy against a culture, a culture that was allowed to do something that, David, you wouldn't have done when you were at the Mirror, to allow a culture where people were basically saying, here's a number for Sienna, let's just see what she said to Jude, really. Yeah. You know, and then to perfect, to, for it to be acceptable, to say, I'm going to listen to this dead child's mobile and delete yeah. calls. That's so far and away mm. beyond this sense of, oh, we've brought down a bogeyman. I mean, it's not about, it's a culture that does went it, horribly uh, wrong. Does it speak as well to, I mean, there was almost, a, it seems, a culture of immunity. I mean, they really didn't seem to feel as though mm. they would be stopped by anyone. I mean, like, they certainly weren't going to be stopped by by politicians, they, they won't be really stopped by the PCC. power corrupts and ultimate power corrupts ultimately. I mean, they, you know, obviously, but as it, as it's spreading, he was it, a very it, powerful man. It would appear as though, you, know, you, you can almost see how, you know, they're, they're, if, you were, if you were there in that newsroom, who was going to stop you? Who was going to stop you from yeah. doing anything? That, 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 I think, has been a major problem. It's interesting now that the Wall Street Journal has its own ethics and standards committee, which has criticised uh, Wall Street Journal reporters who interviewed Rupert Murdoch for giving mm. him too easy a time. What we've lost in this country, certainly from the... I, I'm the only representative here of the filth estate, and certainly from the, <laughs> from the, from the point of view of the filth estate, what we've lost is the, the pipe-sucking, grey-haired editor-in-chief figure who couldn't actually put anything in the paper, but by God he could stop things going into the mm. paper. That we've, we've lost that sort of moral sense. 
And it is may that be... what you did? You sat there stopping <laughs> stuff, getting no, it to I, the paper? No, I, I worked under two editors-in-chief. <laughs> Interestingly enough, when I was editing for two papers in, in Australia, for Murdoch, and there were two editors-in-chief there, and they were the bane of my life, because I was, at the time, uh, you find it hard to believe now, but at the time I was a thrusting, energetic, vital, <laughs> desperate to bring down government's <coughs> young editor, <coughs> and they were the guys who would suck on their pipes and, and say, no, you can't do that, that's going too far, you mustn't do that, and they con I was controlled, and I hated it, and I hate the idea now that I'm proposing that, that we, we, we actually have to go back to something, we have to put some responsibility back. It's no coincidence, I think, that the last four or five editors of The Sun and the News of the World, um, and uh, yes, and the current editor of The Mirror, have all come the pop showbiz route. Yeah. They, they, they haven't been night editors, they haven't been news editors, they've been quite young. Uh, mm. This isn't a play from, a, from an old greybeard, but uh, they've been quite young. They, I, I mean, Piers Morgan was editor of the News of the World at 27, 28. Um, Andy Coulson, early 30s. Mm. And nothing, no, no sort of ethical background, no, no overweening sense of somebody above them between them and the, M, the, the chief executive officer saying, hang on, don't do mm. that, don't go there, you mustn't. Well, that, of course, is the figure that any of us in the electronic media bask in. We have a controlling mm. editor. Mm. And um, you know, I would be the wild man of Borneo, but for Jim Gray. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, this, this, is a, this is a very interesting reality. And of course, Ofcom. Mm. And we yes. will obviously have to talk about regulation. Where are you on regulation, Toby? I'm um, uh, not in favor of statutory regulation. Um, I think that um, uh, several reasons. One, um, I, I'm, I don't think that the print media would be able to speak truth to power as often and as effectively as it does if it was subject to statutory regulation. People say, well, the broadcast media is subject to statutory regulation. Could Channel 4 News have, have, have bought a stolen CD in order to break open the expenses scandal? I'm not sure they could have done. Um, I think that if you, if you do subject... No, I think they could have done, actually. Really? Yes. Well, I mean, I, well, I'll give you an alternative to that. <laughs> I mean, I've just made a program about rogue landlords where we used secret filming, right? And I, I, we got somebody hired by these landlords, goes in with a camera in his belly button and films dreadful things going on. <laughs> now, that, the, the procedure by which that had to be done, there had to be checks all along the line and different people at different levels had to sign off on it. So that if Ofcom came to review it afterwards, or when Ofcom came to review it, it could be justified. And if not, we would be punished. <laughs> but that doesn't sound quite as um, uh, bad as paying for stolen goods because the story that they might disclose would be in the public interest. And I'm not sure that a statutory regulated... I, I, I honestly think that if that. somebody had brought that along and we were aware of precisely what the contents were, we'd have done it. I think another reason um, uh, to, to, to be very wary of increasing uh, the degree of regulation of the print media is it's going to be impossible to subject the internet to that same degree of regulation and that will only accelerate the decline yeah. of the print media and I'm not sure that would be a good thing. And I think thirdly, this, this scandal doesn't really represent a failure of the press's ability to self-regulate. Yes, the PCC hasn't come out of this covered in glory and didn't do a great job in its investigation of the phone hacking. Uh, but it did have one. It did have an investigation, did yes. Oh, I was unaware um, of it. It did. It lasted two hours, I think. Uh, two hours. <laughs> but, uh, right. uh, but, but actually, it was The Guardian, uh, primarily, who brought the story to light. So that is an example of the press successfully regulating <laughs> itself, is it not? Five um, years. Well, Five years it took, and all the rest of the press ignored it. Well, the main, fa the main, the main fa I mean, it's not as if we don't already have laws in place to prevent things like no, phone but hacking. The level and of it, corruption it, it, was such that the police weren't going to start Investigate so the things. police are at fault. It's not. It's not. It's not because there was no statutory regulation of the press. It's because uh, the police didn't enforce the law. I mean, it's a failure of law enforcement rather than press regulation, isn't it? Partly. I mean, I. I. I I'm not for statutory regulation. Um, uh, fine enough. We came out with our own recommendations last year, um, uh, which is about about sort of yes, changing the current system, um, uh, which which didn't happen, but perhaps now will. Um, but I think. That, so, so I think. It seems to me as though there are, uh, if you'll give me the 
literally wait, four different ways that we could go from now on. One is to sort of reform the current system, which is beef up the PCC, which is the preferred option of probably people um, with, uh, uh, from the newspapers, in particular the tabloid side. The second is what they're referring to, Clegg and, and people are referring to as independent regulation, which, which I, think, I think what they mean by that is sort of an advertising standards association type approach with a statutory backstop, um, but a long way back. Um, the third is a sort of a watered down um, broadcast model spread across. Um, and the fourth, which is, which is I think in many ways the most interesting, but the one that people aren't discussing at all, is actually um, you, you, you redefine the law and specific laws, strengthen some, weaken others, um, strengthen the public interest defense and the sort of First Amendment type defense, and you actually get rid of regulation. You actually take media regulation away. Um, and that way, actually, you deal with the whole thing to your point, Toby, about the digital environment, um, which is so plaguing any discussions around reinvention of PCC or... or so you let a judge is, be the final arbiter? Well, in, in certain cases. So, for example, you can have... Um, uh, you, you lower the bar significantly, so you can have fast-track fast track arbitration and things, so people much, much lower fines and much more easily accessible. But essentially, yes, you, you sort of... You, you have a very clear, very concise privacy law. You have a very clear <coughs> sort of First Amendment type public interest defense. Well, um, you've thrown in as an aside a privacy law. That's, that's yeah, really the problem is we'll end hot. up with a privacy law, but not the First and Amendment. that's hot. Well, as a civil law. We can't have a First Amendment when we don't have a constitution. Mm. Well, that, that's another discussion. Um, but yeah, we, we, can have, we can have a public interest defense. We already have a Reynolds defense, um, which is a process-driven defense. We can have a much, much stronger and clearer public interest defense, which would mean that journalists would actually um, feel emboldened to do things like secret filming and stuff because they'd have much more clearer guidance as to when they couldn't couldn't do it. Well, the only problem with that, and, and I think it's really an interesting thing, and something does have to happen. I mean, I'm, I'm against statutory regulations, but I don't think there are any journalists who, who aren't. Mm. Um, because the whole notion of, you know, you're holding power to account. If the, the powerful are then judging you, you're, you're stuck. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that we had a judge-led libel system. And, uh, you know, we all remember that was the, the, you know, that is still such an issue where the weight, the balance of evidence so often went against newspapers. You know, it was always for Absolutely. them to try to prove a public interest was a bugger to, you know, trying to get the Reynolds defence, even on Trafigura, was but a complete <laughs> nightmare. Part of the problem here is that is Article 10, newspapers and others have been unwilling to argue on the basis of Article 10 and to, to argue for a strengthening of the public interest because many have felt that it would constrain their journalism, it would constrain doing the types of things that have been done over the last decade. Because the, the clearer, more clearly you define the public interest, the less easy it is to justify doing things like hacking Millie Dallas' phone. Mm. And it became, you know, Article 10, uh, you know, it was increasingly being used for things like finding out who Tiana Menor was sleeping with, which frankly is never going to work, is it really? That's the most odious part of, of what's gone on. Mm. I think, I if I were to be asked, um, <laughs> there may well be occasions when one could justify uh, illegality. Mm. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, when, when the end is justified, you know, the means are justified by the end. But the idea of, 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 of bottom fishing, of, of seabed fishing, of trawling, of just simply saying, well, she's interesting, he's interesting, let's listen to their phone conversations, let's see what comes out of it, is, is, is utterly odious. And I don't think we're anywhere close to controlling that. Unless, and, and it's all very well talking about keeping the press out of it, you know, self-regulation shouldn't be, we need independent regulation. But until you until you can impose some sort of uh, moral structure on the press to to control itself, you know, mm. even the even the, the 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 most extreme red top tabloids, until you can make them see that they have to control their their own industry, I, I think it'll always be the press versus any sort of regulatory system or semi-regulatory mm. system. But they can you tell me, hand on heart, that there are no editors on the PCC? who have knowingly commissioned hacking? No, I can't, because I don't... <laughs> I, no, because I don't know. I mean, it's all real to, to sort of... Uh, no, but because, in fact, of course, and I think you were hinting at this, it was endemic in certainly the tabloid and possibly beyond that in the press. This is a massive thing which has infected virtually all popular journalism in this country for the last two decades. I... I had lunch with a notorious um, 
Hacker. Former tabloid, no, <laughs> former tabloid editor today. And I asked that person, and I can't really name it, mm. it, he or her, uh, <laughs> I asked that person if, if, if he or she would be prepared mm. to commission mm. hacking. And he or she said, yes, I would, uh, but I don't think my news editor would have gone along with it. And he indicated that, whereas he or it, <laughs> this is very difficult, uh, indicated that whereas he or she or it would have been quite prepared to take that on board, the, the, the middle order of his executives would have risen against him. Well, it's the hacked have so far um, accused the Trinity Mirror papers of hacking them. Well, the hacked have accused well, Associated Newspapers of James hacking Hickwell them. James has accused and, well, um, Piers Morgan. Leslie Wayne Ash has accused the Mail. Um, and, of course, we have a plethora of accusations against um, News International. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, one of the things you discover in television is that entertainment <coughs> journalism, in other words, stuff that gets round, you know, who these stars are and what they get up to, is the most expensive form of journalism you can go in for. It's extremely expensive to get the film, the pictures, whatever. Hacking is a fantastically cheap way of just rolling out rubbish. Can I, can I ask a question, yeah. not any of you, but also of um, James Anslow in the front row here, who worked for the News of the World for 20 years and is now a, a professor of journalism. He's gone straight. He's gone straight, well, straight from one to the other. It's quite a expose yourself before. The, the, the question is, um, I mean, I don't think anyone's in any doubt that hacking is fairly widespread. Whether it's as widespread as you just implied, I don't know. But is there a kind of don't ask, don't tell sort of policy on tabloids whereby it's at least conceivable that Andy Coulson and Rebecca Brooks did not in fact know that it was going on? I, I know of no don't ask, don't tell policy. That was never part of any culture um, that I was part of. I mean, and, and this idea that, that, that you just said, John, that uh, <coughs> this was a culture that's been infecting all tabloid papers for the last 20 years Maybe ten, because well, the technology I mean, you know, hasn't I don't been think there. You had mobile phones. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll cut it off at Dave. So I, I, I think that's a bit of hyperbole there, uh, and and so the don't ask, don't tell. No, in, in short, uh, the, the, that wasn't something that was there. That there have always been. Like me, I joined the News of the World in in, in 1977, and there were there were always sof sophisticated, even then, you know, pre online stuff, very sophisticated ways of recording um, interviews and such like, but, but, n but not that kind of crass illegality. I mean, that, that genuinely came as a huge surprise to me, uh, having worked there that amount of time. Um, the, the idea of it being endemic, um, no, not amongst uh, the, the, the journalists. But Mulcair worked for other papers. I mean, yes, he did. He but actually but has <coughs> in the right-hand column who his paymaster is. No, no, in, uh, yes, and they weren't. Sorry, left-hand column. They weren't all red tops either. No. You know, so so I, so I think, you know, this is a not that culture. In, in short, is the answer to your question. Not the don't ask, don't tell. Um, that's a new one. I think if there is a culture there, it's a culture that's galloped away, because, and I've no certainty of this, but I just have a feeling that because there's been a lack of control within the industry itself, and certainly within, uh, you know, my end of the industry, it, there is a sort of we can do anything we like sort of feeling that has grown up, and that has to stop. There's, there's no two ways about it. It, it should have stopped long but ago. But times are desperate, desperate. These papers need to make money. And they figure that the, the very journalism that you talked about, celebrity journalism, uh, stars, footballers, they figure that that is the sort of journalism that is going to bring readership. It, it patently doesn't because circulation mm. falls just as fast as that, uh, that journalism increases. But that sort of journalism is the celebrity journalism that's been inflicted upon the public combined with um, uh, plunging circulations. I mean, the very first casualty has been decency in newspapers, and that's, that's been the problem. Well, has, in, the has investigating what they've been doing up to the figures for The Guardian? Yes, that has. I mean, the last couple of weeks we've had You're rotten we have devil. loads of... Uh, <laughs> well, but you can only yeah. hope. So, I mean, I, I, I sort of disagree, sadly. I think you look at the circulation figures with the tabloids and The Guardian, for example. I mean, I 
actually people do buy those papers. It was the biggest selling paper in the country. Three million still read the sun. Uh, it, I don't, you know, the people aren't out there going, no, no, tell me more about politicians. I don't want to know about Cheryl Cole. You know, they, they will see Cheryl Cole split with Ashley again and they'll buy the paper to read what I she's doing. When I last worked on the sun, which would be 88, 89, just after the whopping revolution, the sun was printing and selling four and a half million copies. Now, to say it's down to three million, and in fact it's just a little bit below yeah. that, that's a dramatic yeah, fall in, yeah. in 20 years. Uh, the, the Express, 50 years ago, sold five million copies. Yeah. The, the Mirror has sold five and a half million copies in the last 40, 50 years. Mm. They're all tumbling away. And but there's, there's, something, there's something in the culture, though, that John, just, just to finish that point, you know, the culture where uh, these papers, which are used to selling millions of copies, you know, they are desperate times now in the yeah. print industry. Circulations are falling, money is tighter than it's ever been, and the demand to get the sort of scoops that on a Sunday shift an extra half a million is huge. And in that sort of culture, you can see that people are more prepared to take risks. And just one final point on the don't ask, don't tell. I think what's really interesting, I, I get your point about you know, what would have happened before. What I do find interesting though, at most journalists, most particularly on the tabloids actually, to have news editors, to have editors who go, great story, and not then say, where's that come from? Mm. It's just absolutely well, it surely is. Well, well, what, what, inexplicable. What is absolutely true, I mean what is true is, is that, the, and I know Dave I'm sure will echo this, that the two questions that, that all editors ask about any big story one is is how much will it cost us in resources and time and those things and the other is can we prove it yes can we say yeah. trousers down can we actually <laughs> say that and how do you know well no one I've said heard that it. to me ever. i've heard it on the tape it's there i've heard, i've listened to the voicemail he's got to have it i mean uh, that is how we all are whether we're tabloid but, but, journalists or, but or the, qu TV. the question is always can we stand it up? Um, can we defend ourselves if the person in question brings a libel suit against us? The question isn't, mm. have we obtained this story using a legal... No, no, that's no. right. Yeah. But, but, mm. but, but, but how we got it is part of it. And we are operating in the, in the libel capital of the world, as we, as we all know. But again, on the legal side, there is an interesting thing here. And I, I mean, there are obviously criminal investigations, and none of us on this platform know, you know the truth of exactly what went on. But, you know, I've talked to lawyers, for example, newspaper lawyers, who have been at the heart of stories, who might say, what's the source of this story? Are we sure? And the investigations editor would say, absolutely, hand on heart, it's fine. Hmm. And then they just read it for, if we are sure, if we can prove this. You know, I'm not saying who might do that or not, but it, uh, you know, there yeah, are yeah. interesting defences here about practices in newspapers. There is, well, yes, go uh, well, I was going to say, there is, a, there is a line, there is a line, which I think was passed during my time as an editor, actually, where the lawyer would come in and, and, and would sit and go through with you what he's read and what he doesn't like and would simply say, you know, that's not publishable. And editors, and I've done it myself, would say, don't tell me what I can't publish. Yeah. Tell me how I can publish it. That's a pretty proper thing to say. I yeah. mean... You're, you're, yeah. you're desperate to get the story, but I think we've now gone beyond. We seem to have gone beyond that, where the lawyer plays has less influence. Uh, and We're not according to James Murdoch, obviously, who said it's the lawyer's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, just before yeah. we throw it open, I want to ask one final question. And again, Toby hinted at it, and that is, you know, the consequence of all this <laughs> boo-ha-ha is not much <laughs> happens to politicians. Maybe quite a lot happens to the Murdochs, who knows. But the biggest consequence is likely to be surrounding the ownership of the papers that he has driven. And the net consequence could be either oligarchs or the death of at least two of these publications. Toby? Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine um, the print media not being the biggest loser <coughs> in this scandal. Um, I think if the print media does end up being subject to um, more regulation, as I say. I well, think even without that, I'm supposing, for example, well, the shareholders get peeved in New York yeah. and say, "Look, what on earth is the point yeah. of owning a thing which is I losing think, 40 million a year?" And I think, I think um, that was probably going to happen anyway when Murdoch 
kicks his clogs. Um, though, having said that, his mother is 102. <laughs> um, uh, but clearly, there, doesn't, there isn't the same appetite amongst um, the younger Murdochs, particularly James Murdoch, um, to own newspapers that lose tens of millions of pounds a year, um, uh, as there is a, in Rupert. Uh, and I think that the, the fear is that um, uh, not only will the press be subject to greater regulation and therefore find it harder to compete with other forms of media and therefore its decline will be accelerated, but more specifically, um, uh, the Times will be uh, sold off to someone much with much less appetite for losing the kind of money it does. Last year, uh, Times newspapers, which at the Times and the Sunday Times, lost uh, 45 million, according to its publicly filed accounts. Um, uh, 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 all of that was lost by the Times, not by the Sunday Times. Uh, and the way Murdoch was able to subsidise the Times is because the News of the World and the Sun made 40 million. I mean, even with the News of the World gone, unless the Seven Day Sun does emerge quickly, News International is not going to have the money to continue to subsidise the Times. So I think even if News Corp doesn't divest itself of News International, it's hard to imagine the Times continuing in its current form. I don't think it'll, it'll necessarily disappear, um, but it'll, it'll end up being a shadow of its former self, uh, particularly if it's bought by somebody else. Well, that, that would be a quite interesting final question before we actually do open it up, and that is uh, Sunday Sun. I mean, I'd have thought it would appear by now. I mean, it, ha has he been broken? He was quite interesting in his evidence to Parliament. Yeah. You could tell James sort of went, no, not thinking of that, and Rupert went, mm, maybe. Well, um, he, was, he was careful, wasn't he? Because in, in front of the Select Committee, he said, no decision has been made yes. as yet. Well, and James he kept repeating, no yes. decision has been made as yet, which yeah. would leave the door open to say, well, actually, we hadn't fully decided, but we were preparing and we were getting ready and everything else. So it still leaves the door right. open. Well, exactly. so I mean, there are certainly no jobs uh, on offer, I, you know, categorically. Right. You know, the, the, mm. There are... You know, the interviews have been taking place with, with, with HR and uh, there are not the jobs, a job for everybody as, as Rebecca... But, uh, but everyone's still on the payroll. Well, that, but that was stated at the beginning, three, three months, it, which we're a month three. into three months. Well, hand in it. <coughs> well, they're all on three months' notice anyway. They couldn't avoid that. But, but yeah, that well, some of them are on one long. month's notice, some are on three months. But I think the, the other thing that gets lost in all this, that what we're in danger of losing, I think we will lose, is, is, is a particularly British, uniquely British style and, uh, uh, and, and uh, of newspaper journalism. Um, not talking about the, the hacking and, and the current news of the world, but this, this unique, and Dave knows this, uh, of a popular but informative and entertaining journalism that doesn't happen anywhere else. Everywhere else, that, that I, almost everywhere else, you get the, 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 the very upmarket and, and occasionally boring <coughs> journalism, or you get the really silly, trashy rubbish, nobody believes it. You don't get the, that, that really class act at its best, that where you get the tension be internal tension between graphic artists, good writing journalists, headline writers, people that set the, set the agenda for the week that the TV and the radio follows, that the, the so-called quality press follows. Year in, year out, those kind of that agenda has been set by really good, popular, but informative and well-informed. Well, well Professor, wouldn't you accept that actually that's peaked and already on the way down? No way was it the sun what won it this time. Mm. Uh, I, no I, I, I think nobody cared a damn which way the bloody sun went. <laughs> Uh, no, oh, well, politically you're talking about. Yeah. No, I, I wasn't talking Brown, politics. Yeah. I was talking. No. I was talking about no, but journalism. I mean, that that journalism you talk of is what gave the sun its power <coughs> to do gotcha. And indeed, to do, um, you know, it was the sun what won it, and will the last person turn out the lights? Uh, the well, gotcha was only there now, for one edition. It now doesn't matter what the headline is because it, nobody's affected by it. It's with it. Do you mean gone. in the past three weeks, or do you mean? No, in the. I mean, if you take the last election, the sun wasn't a player. I'm Again, sure I think you know, I mean, David Miliband was still pretty sun, keen to suck sun up the Sun delivered as a coalition government. It's yeah. about as far from the Sun's ambition uh, as, as a pork pie. But That's well, true, but I don't, I don't think, I don't think well, <coughs> we, 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 can, we can debate that issue separately, but I don't think that uh, uh, politicians until about three weeks ago thought it was unimportant to enlist the support I think this, of the, the, the Sun. This is the the there's a difference. I think the public have disengaged from it, but the politicians haven't. The politicians mm. are clinging on to some of the papers like, like a sinking ship because mm. they think it's the only way that they can still access those sorts of numbers of the population uh, and it still gives them that sort of feeling of power but actually the public uh, as John says have disengaged from it and are not being influenced in the way to vote by but the Sun and the... I, 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 I share James's fear that uh, I mean it may be that um, the tabloid press doesn't have the same bark that it once did I mean I think that's indisputable but 
it nevertheless brings something, I think, to um, British public life. Mm -hmm. Um, which we are now in danger of losing. Well, um, hang on, I think, uh, I think, degradation of public life. Well, I mean, I don't basically, think it's just people degradation. have an unbelievably low view of everybody. Well, I, they we're might all have scum. View anyway, look I mean, at poor let, you. Let, look let, at poor let, you. Let, You've been traduced by these people. Well, true. <laughs> uh, many traduced by the broadsheets. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, look at the stories <laughs> broken scum. by News of the World. I mean, there was uh, there was the Geoffrey Archer story. The vice chairman yeah. of the Conservative Party brought low uh, by being exposed in the News of the World for paying off a prostitute. Um, um, last year there was the Pakistan cricket scandal. Uh, I'm not sure that any, any paper other than mm. the News of the World would have been able to expose that. And I think the problem, if you look at America, anyone who's spent time in America knows that there's something that's happened to the fourth estate. Mm. It's become respectable. They're mm. now hugger-mugger with the people in power. And you're actually more likely to read the truth about the rich and powerful in the National Enquirer than you are in the New York Times. And I fear that something like that might happen here as a the consequence. The extraordinary thing about the sun, uh, you know, look back and hate it as you like, but you, there was a golden age of the sun. Um, actually, it was under uh, a chap called Kelvin McKenzie. Because McKenzie, love him or loathe him, and most of us loathe him, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but McKenzie captured that, um, the Thatcher years and mirrored exactly what Margaret Thatcher was inflicting on the British public, I, in my view, inflicting on the British public, but it, it just had a, an incredible mm. sense of, of mm. self-awareness, of surety, we back our troops, we do this, we go here, you know, nothing was too much trouble, they had a, they, they, and the last newspaper that actually, the last popular tabloid, the last red top that tried to educate its readers, that tried to lift mm. its readers out of what it saw as the gutter and, 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 and educate them rather than just entertain was Cudlip's Mirror. And right. that went to hell on a handcart and the sun mm. shot past it. You know, so it's a very, Don't very difficult Don't educate the people. Market. Do not educate the people. You do not. It does no, not sell papers. No, it doesn't. There's no point in it. Well, what a proud mail. message to be <laughs> out of that moment. <laughs> what a, here's a man toiling for free schools, and there's an editor who says, do not educate people. Close the school down at once. Have them read the sun. <laughs> Is that right, Toby? Uh, no, I think... Uh, it's very cruel. I think, it's a very uh, cruel summary. I, 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 <laughs> I think the... And journalists become part of the establishment. Um, then it becomes much harder for journalists to speak truth to power. And I think whilst The Guardian has undoubtedly done a fantastic job in, Toby, in exposing this wrongdoing, I do think that if without the news of the world and with uh, uh, tabloids who've had their wings clipped and are now extremely wary of crossing any sort of line, lest they get into trouble or get their bosses into trouble again. We're not going to have quite such an energetic, rumbunctious, iconoclastic like, print media. It just feels media. like we're talking about the press in a vacuum. I mean, the, the changes that are happening on the net and in digital media are, are massive. They're enormous. I mean, you know, you like it or, or loathe it. I mean, in America, something like Gorka Media, you could say, is in some ways reinventing the tabloid in, in an online digital world. Um, uh, and <laughs> it's a former FT journalist. Um, but uh, so, I, and, and equally, in terms of people being rambunctious and everything else, I mean, you need to spend a little time on Twitter and in blogs and everything. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of rambunctiousness going on. I think we can get over-nostalgic about um, a culture that had become, I mean, certainly in the case of something like you know, the News International, and astonishingly cynical, particularly Just about, about every major story, my God, there have been enough over the last four weeks, has broken on Twitter long before any tabloids got anywhere near it. True, but I think that the danger is if we become completely reliant uh, on uh, social media and the internet to discover what the rich and powerful are really getting up to. Uh, mm. There's an issue about verisimilitude. How can we trust mm. what we read on Twitter? I mean, okay, you can't always trust what you read in the Sun or the News of the World, but I think uh, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's, because we know that they don't want to risk being sued for libel, I mean, whatever methods they've used to find out about Cheryl Cole getting back with Ashley, um, nevertheless, <laughs> I think we can depend on it to a, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a greater extent than we can on whatever anyone happens to be tweeting at any Well, there's plenty there to feast. The first principle should be that the law should not be broken. What do members of the panel think of um, that matter? Jane. I agree completely, obviously. I don't think it's right um, to offer 25 quid, to, <laughs> as I slightly pompously said to John earlier. Um, you're right. I mean, it's, it's such a basic thing, isn't it? I do think there's a, there's a very important point with this, this sort of debate, and I'm sure John, as the only broadcaster in, in our midst, is, uh, is keen to show how terrible all print journalists are. Never. So, no. uh, listen, let me tell you, know. every broadcast journalist has an inferiority complex <laughs> when sitting next to a written journalist. <laughs> you, listen, you may be chipped paper tomorrow, but we are, 
here today, gone tomorrow, let alone. We don't even wrap the bloody chip. <laughs> 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 But, I, you know, there, there is some really good journalism, and it's certainly not all being done at The Guardian. You know, there are very good journalists at these tabloids. There are great <coughs> journalists on even the Daily Mail, which, you know, you said the last paper that tried to educate his readers. What is Paul Dacre doing but trying to tell everybody how to live their lives? <laughs> um, so, you know, I personally don't think that's great journalism, but lots of people do. Millions every day read it to find out how to be a good woman. Um, but but, but so there obviously are uh, cases where breaking the law is justified. What? Uh, well, I'm positing well, we, that. We would we wouldn't have been able to find out about the MPs' expenses, yeah. abuses, um, had someone not been prepared to break the law and had a journalist or a journalist organisation not been prepared to pay for yeah. stolen property. Let's return to the lawyer. I mean, here we have evidence of hundreds of p elected politicians uh, breaking the law uh, by um, all sorts of subterfuge, a whole lot of peers as well, but that information is only disclosable if we pay a thief to give it to us, a complete breach of the law. Uh, is it right to have broken the law under those circumstances? No, of course it's not. But <laughs> well, then the law's are law. <laughs> <laughs> The first principle that should come out of this scandal is that the law must be obeyed. So you would jail whoever leaked that ghastly material, yes. and well, you would ab absolutely absolve all politicians. No, no, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, forget I'm, it. I, I think that is the first <laughs> principle that should come out of this scandal that the law should be obeyed. Oh, but the, the, the law the itself allows for a public interest defence, which means yeah, the law's that although ambiguous. the yeah. Telegraph broke the law, it was absolutely justifiable, and every newspaper editor from The Guardian, every every journalist would break the law if it meant breaking open a story with such a well, huge public interest. I understand the public interest, interest defence. Which is part of the law. It seems to me that the question that I posed is at the heart of this hacking scandal and has to be dealt with by journalists. Is it well, it is clearly a very, very serious matter and, and yeah, under extreme, extremely unusual. It's very interesting that the Telegraph itself now has been in trouble for the methods it used to extract the attack on News International that it did from Vince Cable. So mm -hmm. even the PCC found that rather an offensive activity. But I think, I think the difficulty of your position is that you, you've kind of reached a sort of false clarity. The problem is that there's a conflict between the different articles of the European Human Rights Act, the right to privacy and the right to free speech, for instance, and also there's a conflict between the European Human Rights Act and British law. Um, so uh, the problem with uh, saying, well, they should just obey the law is you end up vesting judges with far too much influence. Mm. There's no public interest defence for for, for Reaper, yeah. No, but there is for um, there is the things we were talking about, the telegraph expenses, which is why nothing happened. They could have been... But it was a good and fundamental question, and we've answered it pragmatically. I'm interested in the views of the panel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next... Yes, at the back. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Just as a, a, a layman speaking on this, I'm... Or even I'm a lay woman, I think. Lay woman. Thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, picking up, actually, on the last point as well, um, the way that um, I haven't yet seen a compelling reason why, and with all respect to you, Martin Moore, and the Hacked Off <coughs> campaign, why it has been now that this big phone hacking story has broken, given that we know that the practices have been rife for a couple of decades or more. Um, and is there some sort of nexus with this thorny problem of this sort of crisis of privacy that we have in this country? You know, we've got a transatlantic clash, we've got the European clash, um, and we've got the conflict between Articles 8 and 10. But, you know, on, on the one hand, we're told that the invasion of our own privacy is to our own best interest, that we're, we're, we're filmed wherever we go, there's automatic number plate recognition, face recognition. You know, our every move is, is, is monitored for our own benefit. But at the top of the, the, the tree, we have a, a, a few judges telling us what we can read, what we can think, and what we can say. And that does have um, some, I think, unfortunate connection with the absence of any commentary, let alone criticism of what happens in privacy actions um, in the courts, in the, in the Queen's Bench Division, 
that th every single paper has been silent on that in the last eight to nine weeks, and yet that does coincide with this um, complete, complete <coughs> climax of the press are, are in you general. About super injunctions. Super injunctions and injunctions and anonymized orders. The two but things in fairness, have there coincided. Hasn't been a super injunction issued oh. in 18 months. How do you know? Uh, well, we do. Know. <laughs> uh, mm. You think they have? Well, maybe you're a lawyer. I am a lawyer. I'm a lay woman, but I'm, I'm a lawyer, and I believe we're, we're, we're lower than you as scum of the earth. Um, <laughs> for good reason. Only when you come to fee charging. Um, <laughs> but is, is there some sort of connection that um, the press really sort of overstepped the mark in challenging, whether subversively through Twitter and otherwise, and openly in the press, and now news of the world being the scapegoats, but everybody else actually you're all silenced. Martin? Uh, I'm trying to un unravel some of the questions there. Well, well I mean, the fundamental that is that the judges have been uh, constraining a certain amount of activity in terms of even stating that an injunction has been granted, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yes. I, th I think to, to, your, to the point of your question about is this all connected, yes, of course it is. Of course it is. It's, it's all connected, and it's all um, necessarily connected because of the fundamental changes many of them technological, um, that have meant that we can all record anything, we can all publish anything, and therefore any sort of practical con kind of line between private life and public life has pretty much disappeared. So you rely, therefore, on cultural constraints and legal constraints. Um, and cultural constraints, particularly in the case of the, the tabloids, we, we know don't really exist. Um, and therefore, it's focused very much on legal constraints. Now, um, in terms of what that means, and what that means, I certainly don't think, I mean, we shouldn't forget that there were two months where privacy injunctions were all over the front page. Uh, and actually, to your point about why now, why, um, I think there's actually more explanation as to why the phone hacking hit now because of the Millie Dowler case than there is for why the privacy injunction thing started. Because it had been going for like two, three years at about the same rate. And, and, and suddenly it exploded across the press and became a big, big national debate. And I think a healthy debate because the problem we have here is, is, is how we reach some sort of societal consensus around where the line should be drawn. Um, because I think everyone accepts there ought to be some sort of line. It's, but where, where do you draw it and how do you draw it? Because certainly, legally, it's very, very difficult to do because, you know, as we, as we know, anyone can publish. So, so I think, yes, they're absolutely all connected. Um, and yes, they're all on the table. How they'll be resolved, I think, is an open Martin, question. Martin, one thing I'm slightly confused about is it sounded like when you laid out the four um, <laughs> uh, uh, solutions, um, you favoured the one which was to just bring in um, more robust laws and enforce them properly. Maybe, maybe you weren't favouring that, but you certainly Sorry. presented that as, as an attractive well, I, alternative I to statutory regulation. The reason, like, reason I emphasise that particular one is because it's the one no one's really talking about okay. at the moment. But, but it's, it sounds like that's the one that wouldn't prevent the kind of stories that hacked <laughs> off uh, doesn't like emerging on things like Twitter. I mean, I, I speak as um, one of uh, four people who was identified on the front page of the Evening Standard as likely to be prosecuted by the Attorney General for having disclosed Ryan Giggs as the author <laughs> of, a, of, a, of a super injunction. In fact, it didn't happen because actually enforcing the law uh, in social media, and Twitter in particular, is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and does, does, but doesn't that indicate that um, that solution in particular um, isn't going to work if you want to stop uh, uh, people uh, breaking the, stories the, the, about the people part, like Hugh Grant. Part of the key here is, is separating some of the, the, the problems out because if we get if we mush them all together into some sort of soup, then it becomes impossible to disaggregate any of them. There is an, there are there are an awful lot of complexities around um, clearly around privacy. Exactly the, the, the difficulty I was just mentioning, you know, um, around privacy law and any sort of privacy pre-publication pre privacy law, um, which is why some people talk about making it post-publication and trying to work out some way of dealing with it that way. Um, uh, having said that, I think also, you know, we have to sort of also kind of think about in this new environment, we can't, I think being technologically determinist is not very mm. helpful. Just saying, forget it, every, every, everything goes because technology allows it, um, is not the way that we've behaved as a society in the past. We've come to sort of, um, hopefully relatively sensible consensus is about about where we think the line should be drawn and then we draw the law and other aspects around that. Well, Let's take another question. Is that going to emerge? Uh, another question. Yes, in the blue. <coughs> uh, this panel uh, is five terrific journalistic minds. Surely you can come up with something better than your description of Rupert Murdoch as the dark cancer. <laughs> <laughs> 
well, a great entrepreneur. Would, does that help? Um, terrific entrepreneur. Has worked wonders, for, as, as I said before, uh, uh, in, in expanding access to all sorts of things which were very, very restricted in the past. Sport, um, music, films, <coughs> first run films and the rest of it. Um, clearly, the, I mean... I would say the positives probably outweigh the negatives. I mean, that, 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 that's a fact. But the negatives are awfully negative, I, I, which is unfortunate. Tw twi Twitter recommended to me um, <laughs> uh, a, a piece, a 2004 piece by John Lanchester, where he reviewed about three or four biographies of Murdoch. Um, and I, I thought it was the most interesting analysis of Murdoch that I've seen, where he, he takes on the whole question of, is he a devil, is he not a devil? He says, that's far too simplistic to think of him in those terms. Um, he said that Murdoch had sort of two particular driving factors which, which pushed him in the direction he, th that he did. One of which was recognizing that news was becoming entertainment and to pursue that. And the other of which was to say it's all about becoming international and global and pushing and continuing to do deals that expand, expand, expand. And I think actually if you see an awful lot of the stuff that's happened in those terms, it helps to sort of slightly explain how the culture developed particularly at News of the World, um, rather than just seeing him as some sort of evil golden eye type paddy. I think in, in situations like this where, and you, you got this with MPs, I mean, you know, these were um, politicians who for years had caught it, actually even Gordon Brown, I mean, you know, mm. sleepovers, pajama parties <laughs> with the woman he now, you know, attending the wedding of, bursting into tears and how awful it was. I mean, you know, this is all politicians with a handful of really notable exceptions who currently a few of them on the select committee. Um, what happens, it's like the playground bully, isn't it? So you have this sort of person who is absolutely dominating and making everybody whisper and not really be able to say anything. And then suddenly the bully's dead or the bully's down and everybody passes in and tries to kick him. And it, it's a bit like that, isn't it? You know, I mean, the great thing, you know, James Murdoch, who's a, less charismatic in many ways than his father, you know, has this fabulous thing of having Darth Vader outside his, uh, his office everywhere. A huge, life-size Darth Vader. And when I went to interview him, there, sitting, making notes, was Rupert. And it was too perfect an intro that there was the evil emperor of Star Wars fame with the father-son relationship. It was just too perfect. I mean, he sort of lends himself to these fabulous um, black and white characteristics. But it is because of that sense of sort of, you know, a man who is powerful and suddenly all the politicians and everybody mm. lines up to say horrible things about him when he's done some good. Stuff. But Dave, would you not accept that actually in many ways that there is something here which has not spoken its name and that is this great crescendo of activity and interest in Murdoch's power only hit the front page, as it were, at the moment at which consultation over the taker of B Sky B peaked. That's a very strange coincidence. Now, of course, that may be the orchestration <laughs> no, of The Guardian, and I think greatly of The Guardian, but I clearly, you know, I wouldn't ever want to accuse it of in timing anything to coincide with such a thing. But if there is a misgiving about Rupert Murdoch, it is that. Uh, that he, he had an access to power, ensured that he had an access to power. His biographer, uh, Michael Wolfe, said the other night, he's never had to explain anything. Um, Rupert has always spoken power to power. So, um, and part of that power, some people allege, involved affecting the way in which the industry he sought to dominate was regulated. And that was what the B Sky B battle was all about. People spotted that when um, David Cameron said in June of um, last year that they were going to abolish Ofcom effectively, um, they were going to leave it with a sort of supervisory role, but it would have no policy and the rest of it, and that, that he was almost speaking the words dictated by Rupert Murdoch. That was the accusation. That, al that, that almost, for me, seemed to kick off what, what had always been a great hinterland of, of concern about Rupert owning B Sky B outright, of foxifying, um, a fairly efficient and, and, and forward thinking uh, TV outfit. Uh, I love that headline Foxified. Foxified, <laughs> yeah. No. I'm, I'll be foxified if you can have it. But <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I've got a bad chest. My wife this morning said, what, on the way to the, you know, the debate tonight, why don't you get yourself a, 
a packet of hacks. And I said, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> that, that really is not. But anyway. No, 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 your problem is you said the word Foxify and the man visited you. <laughs> yeah, yeah that I think he did. But I, I think there's always been a, a sort of hinterland of concern, which I think David Cameron almost sparked it off with that, with the Ofcom remark. And we suddenly realized that we'd be left without protection and that Rupert would step in. I don't think Murdoch, I think he's been a genius for 50 years. And I think he's built up this enormous empire, which he talked about the other day, 53,000 people, five continents. Um, he, he's, he's, he's built this mountain of sort of wealth. And he sits, he's now 80, 80 years old, and he sits atop it. And it's sort of gone away from him. And he's remote from it. And he, he frankly looks remote from it. And it's an empire that's now out of control. It's not an evil empire. It's not a cancerous empire. It's an empire that is kind of wanting to run itself. And it may well in the next mm. couple of years, it may well just implode, blow apart, no, explode, blow mm. apart. Um, Toby. Well, I, 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 um, I don't think the emergence of a British Fox News was ever um, in danger. Um, let's not forget that uh, 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 News Corp said that if they were allowed to buy the 61% of the remaining shares in B Sky B, they would sell off Sky News. And I think, um, I'm sure you agree, John, that Sky News has enhanced its reputation. Still over. keep 40% of it, though. I mean, when you say sell off, they weren't going to wave goodbye to it forever. They were well, but I don't think there was a suggestion. I don't think it was it was realistic to think that there was going to be uh, uh, Sky News was going to be turned into a, a partisan. Uh, yeah, but that concession was like sort of at the barrel of a regulatory mm. gun. I think I think um, just to respond to what Jane said earlier, I wasn't suggesting that that um, uh, the toppling of Murdoch has been the result of a conspiracy. Um, but I don't think the story would have got nearly as much play. It wouldn't have blown up in the way it did had Ed Miliband not taken that gamble mm. about three weeks ago to go in hard and align himself with the. Guardian and the After various Millie forces Dalla, arrayed against. So I, I, uh, yeah, Millie, Millie, Dalla, Millie Dalla was the trigger, and I think I think that public. gave Ed Miliband the confidence yeah. to go in hard but against Murdoch. But I don't think Ed Miliband would have done that had he not seen some party advantage to doing that. I mean, I think that. And Millie course, Dalla wouldn't have played if the Millie Dowler case hadn't, in a most mysterious way, come to a conclusion. Mm. Three weeks before these e these events. Yes, I mean it was it was a, it was staggering. It was a, from, 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 from from the Murdoch oh, Empire. Sorry, can I just it was, it was sorry, sorry, I spoke. I don't know what came over. Carry on. Come on. No, yeah, no, 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 go for it. Go but but uh, I think I think we, we should you know bear in mind that there was a it was it was a series of different things. I mean, not, not only was it the Dalla case the following day, it was the seven seven the following day, it was the Iraq and the Afghan families, um, and 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 also the Dalla's very and nine eleven, which of course was fiction, which was yeah the mirror. Um, but uh, but but <laughs> let's not forget. That we, so what do you, do you do you mean that you don't think that I don't think there's any had. evidence for it at all. Okay. Well, do you? You don't mean I haven't seen itself, it. No, 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 no. I mean, the idea that their no, phones no, have been hacked, so there's no, no, nobody's come up with any evidence. Very mischievous, I think. But naughty, be naughty even. The more, yes, quite. The more serious uh, attitude that American um, uh, law takes. To, to, to that sort mm. of uh, behaviour in, in their country. Yeah. But this, to, to, to take, I mean, it did snowball, so the stories continued to go on. Um, when, when we went with the Dowlers to see the party leaders, they changed. I mean, the Dowlers, I thought, were remarkable. They were genuinely dignified. Um, they told their story in the most astonishing way to each of the leaders and, and, and explained exactly how it happened and when they found out and everything else. And, and, and actually, you could see the leaders emboldened after that than when they had been before. They were, they were literally sort of much more adamant that they were going to take action on the basis of this. And, 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 and I believe them, they did. I mean, they did, were, were much more forward in the way that they spoke about these issues. And um, because they, A, believed that it was wrong, and B, believed they had the public behind them. But this, this point about, you know, the suspicious timing of this, you know, you could argue it, the coincidence of the Millie Dowler case ending, so all that evidence could come out, then the, the sort of weight that it was in people's mind, and then Nick Davis's story on the Monday, which led to a public revulsion. Which, and you know, remember it, when the Guardian, I was media editor, and we did the story. You know, Nick's amazing story about Gordon Taylor that News International had paid him seven hundred thousand pounds, just like that, and nobody could talk about it. And when we did that story two and a half years ago, two years ago, July two thousand nine. Um, it feels longer, that you expected everybody else to write about it because it was a huge figure. 
and uh, nobody did. Why didn't they? Well, because of this cold of the power, the police that came in and said, this is nonsense, there's nothing to it. The police who turned up at News International and said, anything in this, Gordon Taylor? And people at News International said, no. And the PCC who phoned the Murdochs and said, anything in the, this, uh, this Gordon Taylor? No. Clive Goodman went to prison even though he was a royal reporter and it was six months later and he was a member of the Professional Footballers Association. I mean, it just was insanity. And it went on for two years. So to say now that, oh, well, there's obviously some, you know, this, this is all about commercial interests and we desperately didn't want them to buy Sky. Well, you know, there is a point to you think, hang on a minute, this is an enormous power that this man, ha this organisation has, you know, 30% of the press and, and now the biggest satellite company, and it's all being ushered through with, you know, this minor, uh, have Sky at news at arm's length. Of course, that, that raised concerns, but nobody wrote about it. Oh, I I and then when <laughs> Millie Dowler happened, there was a real sense, hang on, that just isn't right and it wasn't journalists it was the public one thing i'm curious that. about is 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 i mean i think i think that the fact that um jeremy hunt was on the verge of giving the b sky b bid the nod um certainly fueled the fire um, because it made the government seem uh complicit uh, and that inspired miliband to go in hard um but had the guardian really wanted to bring down murdoch had he wanted to kind of score a direct hit on the Death Star. It would have been better <laughs> to keep the Millie Dallas story back until Jeremy Hunt had given the Beast Guy B deal the nod. I think then the government would have fallen. <laughs> <laughs> Pigs will fly. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but, what was going to replace it? Well, I mean, I think, I think, I think, the, I think, the, I think uh, yes, who knows exactly what would have happened, question. But, but it would have been a much more, it would have been a much more, it would have been a much more inflammatory If only news stories were that orchestrated. Why did Nick Davis break the story when he did? Uh, was sorry. Mark Lewis. Before I come to you, I'm going to take the lady at the back because she had the mic for you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm quite curious to know what you think of the, the concept that a, a country gets the media that it deserves. And because this doesn't seem to really have been happening, Murdoch has a, an international uh, empire, as you pointed out. Um, but this sort of thing doesn't seem to have been happening elsewhere. And there are now um, serious hints that it's, um, it goes way beyond News International. Um, does, a, does a country get the media that it deserves? And what does this say, that we're at this juncture, about, about Britain? I can tell that you're from the <laughs> Antipodes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to ask you a question in return. What did we do wrong to deserve it? <laughs> no, I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do we get the, the media we deserve? Dave? I think any country gets the media it will put up with. Um, and having worked not just in, in Britain as an editor, but in New York and in Sydney, they're three quite different types of media. The New York Post is wild in American terms, but not wild in British terms. In Australia, I, I was censured for uh, carrying a photograph of, uh, on page three, as it happens, in the Daily Telegraph in Sydney, of um, Mary Poppins, you know, the actress? Uh, Julie Andrews. Julie, Julie Andrews. Uh, topless, and uh, with the headline, Mary Popouts. And that, that, <laughs> that, out, that outraged Australia, well, outraged Sydney, and, and I, I was severely censured. <laughs> No foxification there then. Um, <laughs> but, but so you, I've, I've long been a believer that, let's talk about the British public, because I think that although we here probably sit and think, you know, we sit in judgment and we, we, we have our middle class mores and, and, and we, 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 we feel that we, we like responsible, respectable newspapers. And you ask any person in the street, any man and woman on the Clapham omnibus, what sort of paper they want. They want foreign news, they want, they want politics, they want in-depth analysis. It's crap. What they want is celebrity journalism. And, and it's, driving, it's driving newspapers at the bottom end of the market that have not a lot of scruple to provide what the, the, the what they perceive that the public will pay for. And you know, you can you can go on till you're blue in the face, as Cudlip found in the fifties, putting in you know uh, special sections to explain politics and explain economics. It doesn't work. They want they want 
tit and arse. I'm sorry, but they do. They want that sort of They want to pop out for a Swiss, Swiss one. You said earlier that that didn't sell newspapers. Well, I, I don't believe it does, but, but, the, but the, there, is a, there is a big enough, um, there's a big enough, uh, you know, a swell, groundswell out there that it reacts with jour journalists. They put younger and younger editors in charge with less and less background, with no controls around them. Uh, as long as the profits are coming in, it's a river of gold, you know. But and they'll, 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 I, they'll I, I wouldn't agree with Toby earlier, though, because this, this was not the failure of the press completely. There was a culture which allowed a sort of cheeky, chappy, fun, biting journalism to get completely out of control and break cultural mores and the law. Uh, however, there is also a journalism. But the lady's right. We, we <laughs> there didn't is a mind. Journalism, we but, didn't well, mind. We went on buying the papers. The Guardian papers. and others, the Indie, the, you know, lots of other journalists actually took several years and lots of time to expose it. Uh, so, you know, do we get the. Well, I, I would say I the British newspapers <clears throat> generally are good to read. I think it's important to say here as well, what we, it's, it's silly to look just simply at a certain part of the press and just at the press. I think if you look at the media we deserve, you have to look across the media. You know, the, the media as a whole uh, is fantastically mixed. We have Channel 4 News, we have, you know, we, we have lots and lots of both broadcast and print and online phenomenal stuff. And, and, and if you look at the, most countries, I mean, you look at the states, and I refer to Gorka Media, you can look at Fox, you can look at, you know, the, the, you have to, I think, look at it in its totality. And what's happened with the press is, is partly, yes, a, res a response to the public, and it's partly a response of a complete lack of accountability and any mechanisms either within the organizations themselves or regulatory mechanisms to, to, to But then it comes happening. back to your digital point and I where I would respond to you it's say I am completely uplifted by the revolution that has happened in my reporting life as a hack. When I started a few people wrote to me in green ink underlined in red complaining about things that have been on the air maybe three a week. Now <laughs> every day of every week I have an interaction, either on Twitter or on email or in some other mechanism on the social network, in which people make uplifting contributions to what we're doing. They may say we were wrong, they'll say why we were wrong, or they will ask us why we did this or why we did that, or they'll say how much they enjoyed this or how much they enjoyed that. And I believe that actually we do not get the, I would say that the tabloid media do not give us the, the, the press that we deserve now. I'm only saying this in order to kick off a debate, but I would argue that we don't get the media that we deserve um, because actually we underestimate what decent people we are. We are right across the board from top to bottom. Everybody I ever meet in a train, everybody I ever meet in the street, everybody I ever meet north or south, and I meet lots of people because I'm still a reporter on the road. I, 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 I am absolutely amazed at what amazing people populate this country. And they are not people who want to undo the zip I think of some footballer playing for Sheffield well, I, think, I think, John, you probably live in a, you live in a more benign universe than me. And I think, I'm an optimist. I think the, the, the reason the universe presents itself as more benign to you is because people want to come and pay their respects to you because they think you represent something fine mm -hmm. and respectable. No, and, but, uh, and but it's how they want they, foreign they, news they, and political they, they, like, they want to be the quirkiness. They, they, they want to be up yours. Watch, watch Channel 4 Delors. News. Delors. But I, 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 think, I think that, um, I think that uh, you're right in that um, uh, we, we, the British public clearly has a huge appetite for the kind of stories that tabloids have been providing them with for the past God knows how many years, over 100 years. Um, and I think that a lot of um, the animosity that the tabloids are currently attracting, uh, particularly The Sun and the late news of the world, is because um, people were kind of disgusted with themselves as Dave said, they would mm. like to think of themselves as only wanting to sit down and watch Channel 4 News in the evening <laughs> and not watch uh, something far less respectable, not watch some freak show later on on Channel 4 about the fattest man in the world or whatever it might be. Um, and, uh, 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 <laughs> and I think Dominic, Dominic, Dominic Lawson had a good line about, uh, he didn't actually quote Macaulay saying there's nothing more absurd than the British public in one of its periodic <laughs> bouts of moral outrage. But he did say that, uh, that, that, that the way in which the the, 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 the what, what had partly fueled the scandal was the British public raging like Caliban at its own reflection. And I think in that respect we do get the media we deserve. But the web tells us that what people really want is pornography because pornography still drives the web. <laughs> so do we give people pornography? Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's not for us to decide, John. It's well, but people, and, if people, no, I mean, if people want pornography, why aren't we giving it to them? Uh, we are. They're getting it. <laughs> <laughs> not on Channel 4 News. Tablet, I haven't seen much pornography. You're in the wrong part of the internet. When I, when no, I, I've on, seen it on the internet, but I haven't seen... <laughs> Quick, ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, yeah. Unfortunately, I've got a very, I suppose, a moderately high-minded question. So Good, thanks, God. <laughs> slightly, um, slightly in the wrong order. Um, probably be better a bit, a bit earlier than coming after that. Uh, I'm Gavin Reese. I work for the Dart Centre. Um, and my question is, we've sort of decided through the scandal that, home uh, that phone hacking is bad and so forth. Um, Mike, for victims and uh, victims and the families of people who've been affected by crime and disaster in different ways, it's very often the conversations that they have with journalists that can be problematic. There are journalists who interview with enormous sensitivity and great skill, and there are others who do it less well, and they do all sorts of other things other than phone hacking in order to obtain the scoops and the stories they want. So looking ahead to the inquiry, I wondered what the next set of issues we might think about calibrating our moral compasses to are, and what the panel's thoughts would be on that. Jane. Are you asking for the sort of next potential wrongdoing in the press, or about uh, you know the way we handle or journalists handle uh, issues, you know, reporting? Um, yeah, it's more about how the practical things we handle reporting. So if you think about things like codes, they will say that it's important to show sensitivity. And so, so, uh, so press, you know, the, the PCC code and so forth will t contain references and certain sorts of behaviour are expected when journalists approach victims. But then the question is, what does that constitute? How would you frame that? Do we as a profession or as a trade, perhaps, however we um, talk about ourselves, have enough conversations amongst ourselves mm -hmm. about these skill things? So, if, for instance, somebody has seen their son die in front of them in a, in a crime shooting, how does a journalist talk to the family sensitively? How do they interview them? Do we share knowledge and technique and understandings of these things enough? That's really I, the question. I think something I feel very passionately about and something that's a great tragedy for our industry that is never, ever discussed is the lack of proper training now. Mm. And what actually has happened, um, <coughs> partly as a result of the death of the regional industry, yeah. uh, partly as a result of the way we're funding um, journalism. So. What happens is most journalists now go to a one-year postgraduate course, which obviously they're all in debt anyway, so increasingly it's the richest part of a population that goes on to do these courses, um, who then basically either go straight into a job or they work, they do a blog, or they go and work for a sort of a, you know, celebrity magazine. And um, what we don't have anymore, either, I mean, it's terribly old-fashioned, but, you know, the sort of NCTJ, yeah. which taught you all about um, all these sorts of things, you know, not only legal issues and shorthand and contempt of court, but, but actually about, you know, I worked for a local paper for just under two years, couldn't get away fast enough. But I do remember, you know, when you're from the South Wales Echo and you go to Merthyr and somebody's 17-year-old son has just been killed in a car accident, it, it, you know, it sort of teaches you pretty quickly, you, th there's no way you're going to be insensitive. You're, you're hugely embarrassed just to be there. But astonishingly, lots yeah. of these people actually want to talk because they say, I want to talk about my son, you know, I'm, I, the, the tragedy, the trauma. The local reporter almost is part of the community. That has gone and nothing has replaced it. And nobody cares and nobody talks about it. And I think it's a terrible tragedy. Yeah. Uh, newspapers are dying from the bottom up or from the, fr from, from the far distant outside in. Um, you, you also only get one type of journalist now. You're talking about post-grad one-year courses. You don't get kids who leave school at 16, 17 and go into a newspaper and spend three and a half years learning, as well as doing day release or doing a six-month block course. You, you don't get that. You get, um, what is it called, work experience, slavery. What about really? Professor James? He's taking them through every well, step of this life. <laughs> yeah, like I did both. How, how, uh, yeah, but you're getting them from university, presumably. You're getting them largely grouped around London. You're getting them oh, from, okay. you're getting them from, from kids who, who can afford to do work experience for a year, not earn any pay, not be from the north of England or from Scotland, which is uh, traditionally where we, we got a lot of great digging reporters. Um, uh, you, you're getting one type, one class, one colour, one uh, background of person. 
and it's it, it that is what's feeding into the press now and it's a big big problem it's not just the training it's the background but there's certainly something in what you say that that, 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 that there is we are in danger of not getting the spread of, uh, of people. However, there are journalism schools all over the country. You know this up, uh, up where you're based in the, in, in the north, in the northeast, where all the things that you were talking about are taught. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that on the, and there are still many, many good um, local newspapers. But they do not have the resources to, to do no, everything you've just talked about. This is pie in right. the sky. You know, the, the, this, is, the, this is, with respect, old people looking back to the way things were. It isn't like that <laughs> now. And you, you, um, I can tell you because uh, my is. wife's a right. news I, I, I'm, I'm going to close because we only got, uh, t I've just been given the two minute warning, which was pretty ferociously delivered. I must <laughs> <laughs> two fingers that way. <laughs> <laughs> we have one more question here, and, but I wanted Martin to come in because you want well, to quickly just, make just a point very, on that. Just very quickly on, on, on the specifics, not not the general training, but on the specifics of phone hacking. One of the things that's happened over the last few weeks is quite a lot of we, we've got in contact with a lot of people, uh, some of them victims, some of them supporters. Uh, as a result of the campaign, a lot of people contacted us. Uh, what we're going to try to do is to tell some of those stories um, to explain what happened exactly, and then if possible, try and bring them together with some of the journalists to actually discuss it together and what happened with their experience. I mean, not, you know, I don't want to claim truth and reconciliation, but at least, at least sort of like <laughs> bringing people together to discuss it and to discuss why they were so, you know, the, the experience they went through. Uh, this isn't so much a question, but a disagreement with what you were saying. I'm, I've just finished a master's degree. I'm not from London, as you can probably tell. <laughs> oh, and I've come over from Ireland. There are journalism schools all over the country who do teach you what I think we need to get taught 21st century journalism. John, you went to my undergrad in Preston. And what an excellent to place, too. <laughs> and, um, and a place where the journalism school has transformed the town, the city. Amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I think that we, we do get taught things like ethics, media law, things like that. I think that it's not possible for everyone to go into local newspapers anymore because the local newspapers just, as you said, mm. cannot mm. afford us. So we have to do something. Well, I think that's a very good point to uh, end on. Uh, there's a conflict here because between the sort of grassroots uh, hewing of timber feeling that uh, David has given us and uh, uh, the uh, opportunities that exist across the country that has been offered here. And I'm delighted we've been able to infect the Emerald Isle with, our, um, <laughs> with, with what we do. And I'll end on a story here before I thank my panel. Every one of us has a confession. Mine is this. I asked a tabloid question once. I was sent as a cub reporter to an appalling tragedy in Spain where a gas tanker, a liquid gas tanker, had exploded and all the contents of the tanker had flooded over the tented campsite, engulfing the people who were in them. And they had fled into the sea. And I got there before my cameraman and I met this amazing Dutch witness who said, it was terrible. The, you could see the flesh falling from their bones as they came out of the sea, and then they died. It was ghastly. My cameraman arrives. I find the guy again, and I say, could I just talk to you again? This is now two hours later. And he said, oh, it was very bad. It was so awful. I really, I can't tell you. And no, he went on like this for about three minutes, and I had a deadline at one o'clock to feed the piece. So I said, I, in the end, I was so exasperated, I said, could you see their bones? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and I thought, well, the, his, his answer, he then told the story. And I thought, well, I'll be safe because somebody in London will see this appallingly offensive question and they'll cut it out. But it <laughs> went straight to air like that. And I re received a deluge of greeting. And that was the end of it. I would like on your behalf to thank four absolutely fabulous contributors here on the panel. I'd like above all to thank you for staying awake. And I'm going to complain to the management about the chairing of this meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>